We have a political system that panders to candidates' wealthy donors, not to the public they swear to protect. This creates undue bias, a pay-to-play culture, and corruption that benefits the powerful and exploits the weak. Unfortunately, judges must become candidates and can become influenced like any other human being. We can do better. We can reinstate checks and balances and minimize the undue influence of money in the courts. In this video, we'll discuss how. The solution to corruption in the courts is transparency and accountability. Susan Settenbrino, an activist, author, and lecturer dedicated to fighting corruption, first discusses transparency. What we need, as Professor Susan Rose Ackerman has pointed out, courts must publicize their operation and decision process. Judges must disclose their assets and conflicts of interest. Outsiders, like us, must be able to find out what is happening in those courthouses. A free media with access to judicial proceedings and documents, along with an active civil society to publicize lapses and work for reform. The following steps will ensure greater transparency. Allowing electronic recordings in courtrooms, measuring judicial performance objectively, and providing more predictable guidelines for disqualification for judicial conflicts of interest. Let's look at all three individually. PA Court Rule 1910 applies to electronic broadcasts in courtrooms. PA allows recordings, but only when both litigants consent and only for educational purposes. However, the Constitution guarantees a right to a public trial in a criminal case, and the First Amendment presumes a public trial for civil cases as well. Media access is necessary to educate the public, and electronic recordings is a common, accepted instrument of the media and an effective method to achieve transparency. This court rule should be amended to permit recordings at the request of either party, and the footage should be available for appeals and disciplinary proceedings. Second, measure judicial behavior objectively. This principle has already been considered by the American Bar Association. See the link below for more detail. In short, the American Bar Association's message is this. States with elections, like Pennsylvania, Government's not allowed to use resources to measure candidates, so the role of evaluating judicial candidates falls on attorney bar associations. So how should judicial behavior be measured? A modern example of how to measure judges and judicial candidates occurs in Philadelphia, where its bar association calls its judicial candidate rating system its crown jewel. The bar association publishes who does the evaluating, the standards used, the criteria for evaluations, and the information considered. Now that the courts can digitally store data, patterns in judicial decisions can be accurately and efficiently monitored so that society can and should evaluate judicial decision-making trends. This will expose judicial biases and tendencies with greater ease over the course of time. If baseball and other sports can measure professional performance, so can government. Third, provide more predictable guidelines for disqualification for judicial conflicts of interests. A judge's canon of ethics requires a judge to disqualify herself from any proceeding in which the judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Although the disqualification rules give some definite guidelines, they're deliberately vague related to financial interests and bias. The only guideline is the judge is disqualified when a contribution raises a reasonable concern about the fairness or impartiality of a judge toward a party or lawyer. And the judge should consider public perception or the appearance of impropriety. The only specifics within that guideline is that recusal is not required when the donation is $250 or less. Without further instruction, judges have enormous latitude and attorneys have fear retaliation when they risk accusing the judge of the inability to be impartial, especially when there's no specific circumstances for disqualification. The judicial code needs broader disclosure provisions to instill public confidence and protect the impartiality of the court. We've discussed transparency, now let's consider accountability. To ensure judges are held accountable, we need to eliminate judicial immunity for malicious and corrupt orders, and enforce the code of judicial conduct with a non-political judicial oversight body. Let's discuss immunity. Currently, judges are immune for malicious and corrupt behavior, even when it violates a constitutional right. This means that a judge can act with the intent to harm and give a false order and still be shielded from civil liability. The problem with absolute immunity is that it creates near absolute power, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Remember, judges can take our money, our homes, our family, and even our lives. 
There's a strong argument that judges should be liable for malicious and corrupt behavior that violates civil rights, just like any other individual. Now, don't get me wrong. Immunity from negligence rightly protects courts and judicial independence, but absolute immunity from malice, from malicious and corrupt false orders, causes more harm than good and should be eliminated. Second, Strictly enforce the Judicial Code of Conduct with a politically independent oversight body. Currently, the Judicial Code of Conduct isn't strictly enforced. As we discussed in this first video of the three-part series, real governmental power is in political parties and their powerful donors. They control all three branches of government. This neutralizes checks and balances and eliminates protection from separation of powers. Larry Hohall, a litigant in Luzerne County, that's the same county as the Kids for Cash scandal. He gives a perfect example of how the Judicial Conduct Board protects its own. After he was a victim of egregious judicial misconduct, his complaint to the Judicial Conduct Board went ignored. Watch. I had some very in-depth dealings uh, with the Judicial Conduct Board. I filed a formal complaint with uh, the J JCB against uh, Judge Capolini. So you take all this evidence to the JCB and uh, what happened? I filed a formal complaint um, and I, I met many, many times with the chief investigator, a guy by the name of Ken Fennell, and he came up and interviewed some people up here and um, uh, said flat out, he said, uh, I hope this judge doesn't have any plans for his big fat pension. That's a quote, because he's going down. And instead, I got a, a two-sentence letter in the mail that uh, my uh, complaint had been investigated and that it had no merit and it was dismissed. But he told me that it was fixed. He told me flat out it was fixed. He said that the judge had contacted the, the members of the board, told them that he was about to retire and that they could better spend their efforts and their money from their budget pursuing other activities as he was going to be out of the picture anyway. And they agreed. Those people need to be investigated and need to be investigated by a federal grand jury. After the Kids for Cash scandal, a nonprofit PA for Modern Courts investigated the allegations of corruption. Ho Hall explained his research into PA for Modern Courts nonprofit group. Uh, I spent time, a lot of time, with this group. It's um, and it's called Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. Look, I contacted these people, and I, I was very encouraged by who I spoke with. I spoke with uh, very knowledgeable attorneys. Well, they are funded by the government. If they upset the apple cart, their funding will be cut. If they help push the apple cart wonderful things will happen. So they're like the fox investigating the hen. Yes. Ho Hall's experience described in his book, The Luzerne County Railroad, illustrates the problem when politicians control the judicial branch of government and protect their own. The only solution is to establish a non-political, independent judicial conduct board. To summarize, we've been dealing with governmental corruption for so long, we've mistakenly believed that corruption's a reality of life with no hope for improvement. But that's a big lie. We can improve the judicial branch of government by allowing electronic recordings in courtrooms, measuring judicial performance objectively, and providing more predictable guidelines for judicial qualifications from conflicts of interest. These measures will improve transparency in the courthouse. Also, by eliminating judicial immunity from malicious and corrupt orders, and enforcing the code of judicial conduct with a non-political judicial oversight body, we can better ensure judicial accountability. These five items are practical steps to help reduce judicial abuse of power in family court. A major step in any fight for reform is in creating awareness. So please, help me share this video with anyone you know who would also be interested. Please subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell, like it, and leave a comment below. Feel free to watch other videos about family law on the Law Center YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. For a free case evaluation related to your legal issue, click the link in the description portion of this video and fill out the form.